Greetings, Science Maximites. I am Phil McCormick, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be experimenting with the balloon-powered car. Here's how it works. It all has to do with Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, we don't, we don't have to do this now. We can, this is all for later. We can build the cars first and then we can, uh, let's go over here. So how do you build a balloon powered car? Well, I suggest you be science maximites because there's any number of ways you can build a balloon powered car. You do not have to follow my design. You should come up with one of your own. It may even be better than the one I built, but I will give you some tips though that make it a lot easier. First of all, you need something to stick your balloon on that has an opening on it. I used a turkey baster for this car. I just pop the top off, and remember to tell an adult that you're using the turkey baster, and then you stick the balloon on there, and it allows you to attach something to the car, and it also makes it easier to blow up the balloon. <laughs> you can use any number of things, even just uh, any kind of tube that you find lying around. It helps you attach the balloon to the car and it helps you blow up the balloon way easier. The other thing you should think about when you make your balloon powered car is how you're going to make the wheels roll. Once you've decided on the base of the car, you could use anything, even just a piece of cardboard like this, you can do your wheels in two ways. The first way is to attach the wheels to the axle. This is how I made the axle of this car. I used a shish kebab skewer and I stuck it inside a straw, just like that. And then I attached the lids to the shish kebab skewer. So the lids and the shish kebab skewer are attached and they rotate in the straw. That's one way to make the wheels turn. The other way is to tape down the axle or whatever you're going to use uh, and have the wheels spin around on the axle. Two great ways to make your wheels turn, and it really kind of depends on the wheels you're using. You can make your own design and keep refining it and making it better and faster, or do what I like to do and make a whole bunch of different cars. So we've got this one. Uh, this one I made out of paper plates, and this is a snorkel. Awesome. This one is the rock car, because there's a rock on it. I've got uh, the dragster model. It's a long broom handle, and it might not work that well, but who, who knows? And this is my favorite design. It's made out of waffles and an ice cube tray. This is why I make a whole bunch of different cars, because I can race them. Here's another fun way you can play with elastic force. Take a milk carton. I prefer Science Max milk because it's the creamiest. 2% cream, 100% science. Wrap some elastic bands around it with some popsicle sticks on the bottom, sort of like feet. Then take some clamshell packaging, which wraps just about anything you buy nowadays, and cut out a square or a rectangle. Then wrap some tape around that square with an elastic in it and put the elastic on the feet of your milk carton. Then Wind it around and make sure you go backwards so your paddle wheel boat will go forwards when you put it in the water. And there you go, a paddle wheel boat. Now it is time to max it up. Mattress, I need, I need a, a better name. But I've made a giant paddle wheel boat that will work on elastic force because I've got surgical tubing as my elastics, and that's an air mattress. And then I use some lumber to hold it all together. And of course I need a paddle wheel, and what better thing to use in a pool than a flutter board. Okay, here we go. So normally you're not allowed to wear your clothes and your shoes in the pool, but I got special permission because of science. Besides, I'm not worried at all, so I didn't wear my swimming outfit because I figure I can totally do this entire experiment without even getting wet. That is how confident I am. All right, now the tricky part, We'll be getting on to the mattress. Okay, here we go. Ha <laughs> ha, 
It's a great name for this. Look, it works great, and I managed to stay totally dry. Huh? Well, almost. Whoa, oh, oh. Haha, <laughs> you thought I was gonna fall in the pool, but I didn't. Uh-oh. My flutterboard has has stopped moving and I'm I'm in the middle of the pool. Almost. Yeah. Didn't think this through. No. 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 No, that's not going to work. Maybe I'll... Maybe I'll wait. So how important is friction? Well, let's say I'm out for a drive. Car tires need friction to grip onto the road. Without it, my car wouldn't be able to turn at all. But that's nothing. Without friction, the bolts holding the wheels on the car wouldn't work. In fact, none of the bolts, screws, or glue on the car would work, and nothing would stop moving or stick to anything else. Even the trees would blow away with the slightest breeze. Friction is everywhere, and without it, nothing would work. Okay, hover disc race round two. This time we decided to have a little bit more thrust, so Helen and I, and I are going to be using fire extinguishers. Now do not use fire extinguishers at home. Fire extinguishers have a very important purpose, and it's not for this, but we got these ones special. Are you ready, Helena? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, okay, here we go. Russell? So, racers, start your engines. And go! Using fire extinguishers gives us a lot of thrust, but because the discs we're riding on don't have any friction, wherever we point ourselves, we just keep going in that direction, which makes steering very difficult. Cars grip onto the road and can go around corners thanks to the friction of their wheels. When you have no friction, it's kind of like moving on an ice rink. Oh no! I'm out! I ran, out of, I ran out of fire extinguisher at the end there, uh, but I, so I had to cheat a little bit. So one for you, one for me, and all of them for friction. Oh, the lack of friction. Or the lack of friction. Science Max, experiments at large. What do we do next, larger fire extinguishers? I think so. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> see you next time. I, I know where we can get some, actually. We can go, if we go to um, the fire extinguisher store where we got these fire extinguishers, I think we can get Big like one. a rack. Building a door in a wall is hard, because how do you make a big gaping hole in your wall without your wall falling over? Well, people have come up with lots of ways to put doors and windows in walls made of stone blocks over the centuries. And you can do this at home with books like I'm doing or with building blocks. Just go up until you're happy with the height and then stack each next layer a little closer to the middle until the final layer touches just like this, and then you take a big heavy book and you drop it right on top, and it's pretty stable, and you've just made a doorway. It works even better if it's part of a wall because you want extra weight on the outside of these books here. So of course, I had to build one that was part of a whole wall. This is the same corbelled arch built out of little building blocks, and as you can see, I went closer and closer together until it meets at the top, and it is very strong. Whoa. Ha-ha! Now, let's max it out! The kind of arch we're building is a corbelled arch, and the Science Max build team and I are using pieces of wood cut to different lengths. How high can it go? We can use my head to... No, okay, wait, wait. It takes a while to get together, but once it's done, it looks just like the kinds of doorways stone buildings had in ancient times. Ta-da! 
uh, there you go, a maxed out corbelled arch. We went straight up until we got to these layers and they got a little bit closer and closer to the middle until the last piece is one big solid piece. And if we built this right, it should be strong enough to hold me up. Yeah! Science! Woo well, it, it held me up for a minute, didn't it?